Well, hello and welcome back to Watchbox Studios. This is Monday Mailbag. I'm Tim Masso and we're gonna be going over a couple of topics, everything from how to fix Breguet to alternatives to the Omega Speedmaster Professional to Rolexes that you can buy without the markup and without the weight. Of course, I wanna say thank you to everyone who's joining us. I can see Bruno G, first in from Denmark, Eddie Landsberg, Russell 996, Hale Bopp, Erwin L, Edward Lennon of Sweden, and Tom P. Welcome, guys, and thanks for joining me. All right, before we start off, let me remind you that there is no better place to buy, trade, or sell luxury watches than thewatchbox.com, also known as the way we pay for these pixels. So thewatchbox.com with full video of most of the watches that we have as well as original photography. All photography is actual of inventory in stock. Thewatchbox.com, 24 hours a day. Okay, remember, Bird Vallée, horological sculpture, $2,700 retail price. It takes three weeks to make one of these from start to finish. Luscious Lucite with reclaimed watch and clock components, individually cleaned, hand chosen for color, form, tone and texture, each one beautifully hand-finished, handcrafted in Bird Valle's New York City Atelier. You can even see the solid silver engraved plaque on the back of each example. This is my demonstrator. You're going to get one that's brand new with full accessories, and they are richly appointed with accessories. If you like boxed sets, you will love this. Okay, batting practice, warming up my monitor with your pitches and my cuts. Okay, Stepan V asks, Tim, I want to buy a Patek Philippe Calatrava travel time 5134G. That's a white gold travel time. But I'm concerned about resale value. Is this a good investment? Okay, uh, Stepan, I see two issues here. First, no. Manhattan real estate, U.S. or German government bonds, and politicians are great investments. Those are all traditional and fruitful investments. Watches are not investments. At best, they're stores of value. The kind of watches that gain value often are the realm of the super rich and speculators. And frankly, I'm not in that category, and I'm sure you're not either. So the Patek Philippe 5134G was built from well, the 5134 in general was built from 2003 to 2008, so there's basically zero chance of buying one new today. And pre-owned watches rarely lose much value. They tend to depreciate, and then that's usually it. Typically, there's an 8 to 12-year depreciation cycle before a watch will stabilize completely, and then pretty much lose no more value. Well, this watch is solidly outside of that window. So if you buy it, the cost of owning this watch is going to be servicing. It's going to be maintaining it with new straps, there's really not going to be much that's going to depreciate here. So again, if you buy it and you sell it privately, you're not going to risk your investment. You're not going to make any money. You're not going to lose any money. There's the cost of maintaining nice things, but that's service and it's understood. Now, I will say new watches create concern about resale, but if you're deeply concerned about this, only buy older or less costly watches to limit your exposure. And again, at this point, the cost of owning a 5134 with the newest of those watches, now a decade old, it's going to be service, straps, and possibly insurance. Okay, Fabio G asks, hi Tim, what is the most natural rival in the market for Omega's Speedmaster Professional Moonwatch? Okay, this is a great question because I have to say, we often compare Icon watches to Icon watches. So we mention the Speedmaster alongside the Daytona or the Sub from Rolex. We mention it alongside the Navitimer from Breitling or even the likes of the Nautilus from Patek Philippe or the Royal Oak from AP. Well, that's great. They're all icons. They're all timeless, but they're not price point or functional equivalents. So let's try to stay as close to price and function and size and character as we can. Okay, so Breitling Cosmonaut or Navitimer reference 81600. These were built in the late 80s, early 90s, and they're a great comparison because they're right in the size range. These are 41s. The Speedmaster Moonwatch is a 42. These are steel, so is the Moonwatch, and they're both powered by the same Le Mans 1873 base movement. In fact, if you open these up, you're going to see an Omega Caliber 861 inside in all but name. So these are about as close in terms of character and size and function and, yes, price as you can get without actually having a moon watch. Now, these are great buys, about $4,000 to $5,000. The Cosmonauts, which are a bit rarer, tend to trade for a bit more, and you will get delicious tritium patina, the real thing, not fake, when you buy these watches from the 80s and 90s. Now, moving on, there's another watch from this period, a little bit later, 1996, the Tag Heuer Carrera Re-Edition. There are a couple of different versions, CS3, 110, 
3111, which you can see right here with that gorgeous black dial, and then there's a 3112, which is sensational with a salmon dial, and that would be the one I pick. But again, 37 millimeters in stainless steel, and it's the same 1873 Le Magne manual wind Bausch. So you're talking a very close aesthetic and functional match. But again, pricing, a basic moon watch on a bracelet costs $5,250, whereas a Daytona costs $12,500. These you can buy pre-owned for about $2,800 to $3,800 with the salmon dials being being on the higher end of that scale. And finally, we're sticking with our Lemania 1873s here, but also from the late 90s, maybe some in the early 2000s, the Eberhard Aviograph. This is the reference 31032, stainless steel, 40 millimeters, again, the same Lemania Abausch inside, manual wind. If you open it up, it's the same type of finishing you'll get in the Omega. It's also an aviation-themed chronograph, so it fits the bill. And you can buy these for $2,000 to $3,000 pre-owned. So the truth is, you really can compare a current Daytona or Breitling Navitimer to a Moonwatch, because the Moonwatch on the bracelet is $5,250, and the most basic Navitimer with a 7750 in it under the new Georges Kern regime is about $6,040. And if you want a B01, you're talking about $2,000 higher than that. So it's not a price point equivalent. These are your best bets if you want to go out, save some money, and buy a Moonwatch equivalent with the same running gear. Okay, folks, remember, stay with me online when the broadcast ends. I'm very active on Instagram these days. I've really taken to the format. I also post a lot of video. I just post a one-minute review of a Jacques Dro tourbillon reserve de manche. It's the Le Chaux de Femme tourbillon, 28 pieces in white gold. You're going to want to see this, but I try to maximize my video exposure and give you more on Instagram than just a quick shot and a hashtag. So Tim underscore Masso, follow me on Instagram for fun videos. Okay, and if you're watching this recording, please comment below and subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. You'll also get more of our great content almost every day of the week. Now, wrist shots. I asked, you answered. Your wrist shots coming up, led by Ryan M. At the head of the line with his Longines Big Eye Chronograph. A wonderful value proposition, as he notes, miles of style for not a ton of money. Now, Robert T. from Wales actually shares one of his many watches, all chronographs, with his F.P. Journe Santograph in platinum, and you can get a broader view of the McLaren that he's actually driving in that shot. Uh, Robert was kind enough to send me a couple of chrono photos, so we're going to be using them over the next couple of shows, also rolling in style. And hey, since he's from Wales, UK, that's domestic iron for him. It's the patriotic choice. All right, Dave C., offering insights into cuff compatibility, with a watch you might not have expected, he's showcasing his Omega Seamaster 300, proving that yes, you can wear a modern diver with historic style below a dress cuff. And finally, Tudor A, despite his name, is a fan of the expansive open road and his Speedmaster CK2998. And I have to say, I approve on both counts. I'm a fan of cars, and the Speedmaster CK2998, I think we've got a picture in here someplace, is my favorite modern Speedmaster limited edition. I have a special place in my heart for it because I was actually at Basel World in 2016 when the 2998 with blue ceramic bezel actually showed up. And since that was delayed, why don't we give them a full screen? Very cool. That is my favorite modern Speedmaster limited edition. All right. Send your shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your bits on my pixels. All right. Viewer mail and questions. The best Rolex to buy new and acquired tastes in watches for collectors, as well as the future of Breguet and how to fix it. Okay. Bump, 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 and I can see we've got lots of fans of that McLaren 650S from JBO Surf on the other side of the world in Adelaide, Australia. Okay, and I see JBO Surf saying, Tim, microphone needs adjustment. Uh, back end crew, if you can take care of that, much obliged. Okay. Sylvain R. asks, Hi Tim, frankly, I'm shocked by the current price of some pre-owned Rolex subs, GMTs, and Daytonas on the secondary market, and I don't want to wait 18 to 24 months or take a bath by purchasing one of these either new and waiting or pre-owned over list. So what Rolex, any Rolex watches right now that can be purchased new 
pretty much on demand without a wait or purchased pre-owned without a premium. Well, that's great. I've got a list of Rolex sports watches that you're going to desire. You're going to find one watch here that you like that you can buy with either zero weight at the dealer right now or no pre-owned markup on secondary. Okay. From 2016, we were talking about new Basel World watches that year. The Rolex Air King 116900, 40 millimeters, tons of style. You've got the Explorer dial with the tri Arabics, but you've also got a full aviator style Arabic numeral calibration for the minutes and seconds. Beautiful splashes of both yellow and green. I love this piece. 40 millimeters in steel, $6,200 retail. You can pretty much buy that watch right now at an authorized dealer without a wait or at most, you would come in, you'd order it a week to two weeks later, it would be there. Now, if you want to buy it pre-owned, I find that they're going for between $200 and $1,000 under list price on the pre-owned market. Now, let's say you're a monuments man and you want an icon. You don't want to go Air King. You don't want something that's off the beaten path. The two pillars of Rolex right now are the Daytona and the Sub, and we've got a Sub for you. The Submariner 114060, or as Rolex simply calls it, the Submariner. This is a watch that came out in 2012, still current, the Sub C without a date. 40 millimeters, $7,500 retail. This is a watch that does have a little bit of a weight if you want to buy it new at a dealer, but if you want to buy it pre-owned right now, you can pick it up right at about list or I've found up to $500 below retail. Again, it's going to be age dependent, one from 2012, 2013. It's probably going to be a watch you buy for about $7,000 US. So this is one you can pick up without a pre-owned premium right now. The Milgauss GV and the Z Blue. I'm going to throw up the GV because I think it's probably the more popular and uh, I would say more versatile watch to wear all the time. I happen to prefer the shocking electric blue dial of the Z Blue, but this is a watch that retails for 8,200 US dollars. It's been on the market for 11 years now, and it's pretty much a watch you can walk into a dealer and order on the spot and expect to carry out either from inventory or have in your hand within a week. Now, if you want to buy pre-owned, there have been a couple of discontinued versions of this watch. The white dial is discontinued, and the black dial without the GV, uh, Glas Vert, the green crystal, those are watches you can buy right now for between about $5,000 to $6,000, the lower end of that scale being the white dial. You can pick that up right now, pre-owned for between five to six, and if you want to get the black dial, you're going to be looking about $5,500 to $6,000, including the GV. The GV would be in that price range pre-owned. Now, complications, absolutely. The Explorer 2, the 216570, came out in 2011. The black dial is a little bit more popular. No version of this watch is common. And the polar dial that you see here tends to be the most affordable pre-owned. This is a watch that is a complication and a modern one from Rolex. And yet the retail is relatively reasonable at 8100 US dollars. This is a watch that you can generally buy from inventory at your authorized Rolex dealer. And if you want to buy pre-owned, again, no wait list no aftermarket markup, you're probably going to pay between, I would say, $6,000 and $6,750. A little bit less for the polar dial, a little bit more for the black dial, but again, a nice discount. You walk out with enough money to cover a service down the line, and you get a Rolex sports watch and a complication here. It's a dual time for less than list pre-owned. Finally, here's a watch that trades pretty close to list pre-owned, but there's not really a weight in dealers at the moment. And if you want to buy it from the secondary market, sometimes you can score it for about $500 to $1,000 below retail. And that is the Yachtmaster 116622. The Rolesium, Rolex's highfalutin name for a combination of a platinum bezel and a steel case and bracelet. So you've got that gorgeous platinum relieved bezel. You have the dark ruthenium dial right here with blue accents. This is another Basel World 2006 debut that's still hot. Keep in mind, they still do make the older blue dial. And if you can get this watch right here for five to a thousand dollars, five to a, spilling the beans there, five to a thousand dollars below list, you can get the blue dial for another 250 to 500 dollars less pre owned right now. Okay, so. Bump, bump, bump. I can see Steve Bowden just made it to our live broadcast. Steve, welcome and thanks for joining us. And I can see Dr. T from Wales is uh, giving us a shout out for showing his McLaren and his Jorn. He's got a couple other cool chronos that will be rolling out on the show over the next few weeks. Peter Kay and Ian Chan joining us. Robin Rickett. Hi, Robin, and welcome. Okay, great question from Santiago D. 
Tim, I've been collecting watches for two years. Right now I have a Rolex 116000, so he's got his Oyster Perpetual. I have an Omega Speedmaster Professional on a bracelet and a Tag Heuer Carrera 01. Okay, so the big open dial late model Carrera. These are fairly mainstream watches, I admit, and I, I've also noticed that my tastes have been shaped by certain veteran collectors that I've met in person and online. But a great deal of the styles, features, and brands that these veteran collectors seem to love seem weird or old-fashioned to me at this point in my collecting career. So this is Santiago saying, are there any acquired tastes like white wine or raw peppers that come with experience inside this hobby and I can expect to accumulate with time? From my own personal narrative arc within the watch collector community, I can assure you that with time there are acquired tastes that you will pick up. Not all of them, but let me give you a rundown of a few of the acquired tastes in watch collecting that I've observed in my time within the hobby and within the industry right here. Okay, deployant clasps. Yes, seriously. You'd be amazed how rookies in the hobby seem to avoid these. Uh, they can be confusing, they can be cumbersome, they do add expense to a watch. I have been shocked by the number of mall boutique browsers as well as sales associates in the boutiques who don't know how to operate these with any degree of confidence and sometimes think that they are fixed in place even if there's not a screw. So. When you start in the hobby, you may find these a little bit perplexing, but the first time your platinum watch doesn't fall off your wrist at bedside, you're going to appreciate a full deployant clasp. And the first time you see one of your favorite brands trying to cut costs by going from a deployant to a pin buckle, you'll realize this is the way to go. This is luxury. Okay, luxury quartz and appreciating it. It goes against the grain of prejudice and also the innumerable sophomoric forum police that seem ubiquitous in the watch world. This is a Rolex white gold oyster quartz date date, a beautiful piece and now discontinued and highly collectible. But by their logic, Seiko Crador Spring Drive, watches that are finished to a Philippe Dufour standard and use a quartz oscillator, or I mean they would say a, a spring drive Crador lacks the status of a Swiss Army with a derivative of an ETA 2A24 or even a Salida. Again, the world doesn't work in straight lines like this. This is a luxury product even though it's quartz and luxury par excellence. So with time you will come to appreciate luxury quartz and how hard it is to build a great one and also the fact that they are not disposable products. Now gems and men's watches and especially in western markets like North America and Western Europe. Europe. This is very controversial. It's polarizing. It's rife with culture clashes. And I also say that use matters. For instance, is the gem on the case? Is it on the bezel? Is it something that's used as a, as, as a cap to a pivot stone on a tourbillon? Or is it subtle between the lugs, like the sole platinum diamond between the lugs at six o'clock on a platinum Patek Philippe. Well, here's the thing. Most men in Western markets will never embrace gems on a watch, at least gems out in force, like you see on this white gold sodalite dial Daytona. Most will never embrace man gems to this length, certainly. This is the reprisal of the diamond paved and rainbow bezel Daytona that just came out. I will say some, even veteran collectors, will object to discreet use of gems on the exquisite Patek Philippe 5170P that came out last year. This is the use of baguette gems on a gorgeous blue gradient dial as indices for the hours. I love this, but some will never warm up to it because they see gem, they think no. That's the wrong approach in my opinion. Some will find their tastes evolve, this will become an acquired taste and one of the most polarizing. Okay, world time watches. Let's be honest, bewildering masses of information on crammed dials. What time is it in Hong Kong? Who the heck knows? Some people will never get used to reading these things and if you can't warm up to one in a few days of trial on the wrist, it's time to send that thing back unless you just like the look of a highly technical dial. Some folks will never get used to reading these things and I, I understand. Dual times are GMT for you. World time watches are an acquired taste. Now, in terms of aesthetic, skeletonized and open worked dials. For some, this is just a little bit too quaint, too poetic, too delicate, over refined. I understand it's too formal for some. You prefer sporting looks, you prefer simple watches. 
Others will simply find this is impossible to read, and even if it includes a minute repeater as here, they would rather see the time than hear it. So this is something that is an acquired taste. Very few take to it immediately. Some never do. Okay, ultralight case materials. If you saw my clickbait thumbnail, enter stage left, or I suppose I should say stage right, Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Offshore Bumblebee. Now, carbon, forged carbon, titanium, cermet composite, aluminum, some folks will just never warm up to the idea of a twenty, thirty thousand dollar watch that feels like a toy in the hand, or that feels like a Walmart watch, or that feels like a baby G from Casio. Yes, advanced materials can be luxurious and very expensive to execute. You know, the TPT case Richard Mill watches are not priced at bargain levels for a reason. The tech is impressive and the benefits are real. But if you don't love the idea of shooting furtive glances at your wrist to make sure it's still there because it feels like it's disappeared and you freak the hell out when you don't intuitively feel it, you know, these materials might not be for you. At the very least, most collectors do need some time to make their peace with ultralight luxury watch cases. Now, manual wind watches. I know our old company founder and Panerai enthusiast, uh, Paneristi in chief, or Paneristo in chief, I should say, O.J. Watley, he hated manual wind watches. He wanted automatic or nothing. And I understand this because almost everyone who enters the luxury watch space is weaned on sports watches from Tag Heuer, Seiko, Rolex, Omega, Breitling, and almost everything they make is automatic. So a lot of folks come to associate mechanical watches and luxury with automatic winding mechanical movements. Therefore, something like this poor Portuguese anniversary 5441 with a manual wind caliber could be considered an acquired taste and not everyone picks this up immediately. Over time I think you'll find that you'll appreciate that daily interaction with your watch. It's actually a pleasure reminding you you bought something special. Okay, non-round watches. When I first saw the Reverso, I thought that's an old man's watch. A lot of folks who are new to luxury watches see rectangular tonneau and square watches and they just think that's not for me. That's for an old guy with a prune face. And frankly, that's how I felt until I held a Reverso in the hand. And by the way, if you're an old guy with a prune face, we all get there eventually, no offense. I'm just saying that's the wrong kind of prejudice because older folks who've embraced these are realizing what the rest of us are missing out on. I love non-round watches now. I've been overwhelmed by the functional logic of the Reverso and its, its rifle bolt sharp case. Uh, the beauty of the Cartier Santos or even something like the Tank Centre. Uh, gorgeous watches, you really have to come to peace with the shape which is counterintuitive and a little bit different but ultimately opens up a huge horizon of new and vintage watches that become options once you realize that non-round is epic. Okay, I'm all about the Reverso. I own two, including a Tourbillon, so my perspective has shifted. And finally, $10,000 watches. Let's be honest, there is a threshold of reluctance to invest in the ultra expensive watch that even millionaires getting into the luxury watch hobby have trouble accepting up front. $10,000 or more, I find that's just like a magic number, beyond which point a lot of people do a lot of soul searching and may have collected many watches below that price point amounting to more than $10,000 value without being able to jump at something like this $100,000 master minute repeater. That's about what they cost pre-owned. So I've made that journey. I eventually overcame that mental hurdle. Uh, you have to know why you want the watch. If someone else has told you that you should want it or you're doing it to follow fashions, if you're not emotionally invested and there's no broader meaning, it might not be the right step for you to take. You can have a long and fruitful career and be a hobbyist in the watch space for decades without ever buying a $10,000 watch. Make your own choice. Don't let your opinion be driven by someone else or you'll never be happy. Understand the factors that feed the price of a $10,000 watch. Uh, what is it? Is it substance or is it hype? If you understand, you'll feel like you got what you paid for. If you want an image watch and you want to pay $12,500 for that Hublot Classic Fusion, you know you're not getting high horology, but you're all about image and fashion, you might be comfortable for paying $12,500 for that watch. If you're looking for something that's exquisitely crafted, you know you're probably going to look for something else. Just know what you're buying and why so you're not disappointed after the fact. Buy only with freely available funds set aside expressly for the purpose. I have money that I set aside for watches. So if I spend all of that money, 
Well, it was there for watches. It's not my retirement. It's not my financial cushion. It's not money I spend to help out relatives or for an emergency. It's not money that's set aside for future education or self-improvement. So make sure that when you buy the expensive watch, just as when you buy the relatively less expensive watch, it comes out of money that you've already set aside and saved up for the privilege of owning something expensive, not overextension of limited means by credit or a loan. Just don't go there. That makes buying the $10,000 watch easy. And finally, ultimately, engage with the watch community. Make it as much about people as machines. Uh, research extensively. That helps you to create a bond with the watch and understand what you're getting better. Travel to buy the watch. Associate it with uh, an exciting journey or a vacation, or buy to mark an important milestone in your life, like a graduation, the birth of a child, or a, prof or a professional milestone in your life. This will impart meaning to the watch that will make it more than just a thing. Ultimately, you want to create an experience about the watch. Create that experience around the watch. Context and memories rather than settling for a mere purchase, and that's how you ultimately acquire and accept the taste for the $10,000 and up watch. Comment and subscribe if you're watching this recorded. I would appreciate that. And finally, Dimitri K asks, let me quickly check the chat box, see what's going on. Rolex asks, Tim, is the new 36 millimeter Rolex 70 hour movement better than the old 48 hour? I would say the main difference here is that one has a longer power reserve by 22 hours. That's the main difference. They're both very accurate. They can keep the same time. They're both identically tough. The cases they're in are identically water resistant. So I would say the 70 hour is a little bit better if you've got a rotation of Rolex watches and you don't want the one to run down if you cycle you know, two to three days between wearing of your watches. Otherwise, mechanically, they're functionally identical. Neither is better than the other. And bump, 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 bump. That is, I can see, Mark S. is saying rectangular cases look great with formal attire. Probably true. And John H. Tim, happy Monday. What would you suggest for a daily automatic tool watch that I can wear in military uniform? I would say the way to go would be something like the current Tag Heuer Octavia, a great watch to buy. I would say I also really love many Bremont watches. I think the S500, especially in one of its black toned down variants, makes a great sports utility style watch at a reasonable price with a COSC certificate. A little bit of a butch profile for a, a uniformed personnel, but at the same not, time not so ostentatious that it's going to draw uh, unwanted glances. And I would also consider getting the old Bond Seamaster. Uh, you know, consider getting the 253180. It was a great watch when I wore it in the military and it's still a great watch today. Plus, pre-owned, it's a great buy. Okay, Dimitri K. asks, Hey, Tim, do you like Breguet? I've seen you post them on Instagram and speak quite favorably of the brand lately. Yes, I like Breguet. I like them quite a lot. I think no brand in the watch industry right now, with the possible exception of Zenith, has more bounce-back potential based on the in-house capability that it boasts. So I believe that the product and the technical capacity at Breguet have no precedent in the history of the firm, Breguet's lifetime included. The best Breguet technology and watches are being built today. They don't have the cutting-edge scientific value that the Breguet pocket watches had back in the day, but they do push the limits of modern horological science. I will say, I don't believe any brand in the top echelon of horology, save perhaps Seiko or Grand Seiko Crador, Jagere Lecoultre, or maybe Patek Philippe, has the full range of capabilities and in-house artistries not just the tech, but metier d'art that Breguet enjoys under a single brand banner right now. Here's what needs to change. It's time to bury Abraham Louis Breguet, and I mean that in the most respectful possible fashion. The strongest brands in the world, Rolex, Coke, Apple, Ferrari, uh, they all exist independently of living figureheads. Even in the cases of Apple and Ferrari, where there were once towering figures like Steve Jobs and Enzo Ferrari associated with the brand, the brands have outlived them and are arguably stronger today than they ever were during the history of those figurehead founding fathers. So look, you don't need Abraham Louis Breguet to have a strong Breguet brand today. I would also say the strongest watch brands at the moment rely on strong corporate reputation like Rolex or they rely on the personal magnetism of a living person. 
To Rolex, ambassadors come and go, but the brand itself is forever. The same with Audemars Piguet. And I would even say at Patek Philippe, while the Stearns are capable custodians of the brand, I think there's more of an integrity about family ownership that appeals to people. I don't think Terry Stern and his father, Philippe, are just so downright dead sexy and cool that people buy the brand just for that. I think Patek Philippe, the name, the artistry, the quality, the uncompromising standards, and the in-house capability is why people buy Patek today. Also, notice what's mostly unspoken. They don't wear out the names of Jean-Adrien Philippe or Antoine Norbert de Patek when they're advertising Patek today. It's the integrity of the brand, not necessarily the people. Now, at independent brands that are quite strong, you have a living person with towering stature. So yes, F.P. Journe is indistinguishable from his eponymous brand. Richard Mille is the same way, but critically, he's alive. And at MBNF, Max Buser is the face along with his many celebrity friends, his watch celebrity friends. So if you want to go with a person as the figurehead for your brand and the leading light, make it a charismatic living person, not someone who's been dead since the 1820s. Now, Breguet. Stop buying every Breguet vintage pocket watch in existence at auction. That is money that you will never get back for very little gain. You already have an impressive collection of vintage Breguet. I've never seen it, and I've been in this industry for four years. I've worked with the OEMs. I think that means nothing to collectors. Take that money that you're spending at auction, those millions of dollars, and put it into direct promotion of today's Breguet models. I would also say Daniel Roth needs to be brought back. Yes, that Daniel Roth. He's a living legend of independent horology who has done more to shape the modern Breguet style, look, models, and stature than A.L. Breguet or any of his descendants. This is the guy who was Breguet, master watchmaker and leading designer from the 70s through the 80s. He's French. He's a master watchmaker in the tradition of Abraham Louis Breguet, who was born in Switzerland but mostly practiced in France. He is charismatic, affable, historically significant, and critically still alive. He's still active within horology under his brand Jean-Daniel Nicolas. So he's still an active watchmaker. Bring him back. He needs to be reclaimed and promoted as an advocate for the Breguet brand and its modern heritage. This is a face and a man and a personality who has tons of credibility in the watch space with the kind of people who buy the $10,000 and up watch that Breguet sells. Okay. Credible and living advocates are key to the brand. On Breguet's personalities page right now, you go to their website, personalities. Okay, two of the three are dead. That we're off to a bad start. And the guy who's still alive was the son of Nick Hayek Sr. I'm not saying we don't love Mark Hayek, but at this point he's more of a administrator and money manager than the charismatic, horologically relevant face we need. Daniel Roth should be on that page. Now, I'll also say this, Breguet Marketing, you go to their partnerships, you see a lot of fine arts, opera, and classical music, which is the kind of thing in like a cliched worldview you'd imagine Breguet would be associated with. Again, it's time to maybe open your perspectives and horizons. That's the stereotype of Breguet. You need to walk beyond the bounds of stereotype, beyond the opera, the classical music, and the fine art, which is all wonderful. Keep it up, but broaden your horizons. And what the heck is with this solar-powered boat? I mean, that's the kind of thing Blancpain does and, and fruitlessly does. So I don't know. You know, it's like John Oliver would say, cool. Okay, road shows, targeted TV ads that are relevant, events that are relevant, mainstream sports. This is where Breguet needs to put its promotional money. It needs to have a presence on the ground and associate with high-dollar, high-end, prestigious events that are outside the realm of opera, that are outside the realm of ballet and classical music. 
Right now, the, the Amelia Island Concours, the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance, the Monterey Historic Races and Auctions, this is where Brigade needs to be on the ground. I was at SIHH, and a friend who's in the industry told me he was at Pebble Beach this year, and you were no one if you weren't wearing a Rolex, a Richard Mille, or a Patek. Is that horribly pretentious? Yes. Is it also true? Yes. Breguet needs to be in that discussion. Don't take people who are celebrities in music and sports and whatever and try to associate with them. Figure out who is the nomenclatura at these events, the guys who own the Concours winning cars, the guys who are responsible for the top scored restorations, the guys who are buying and selling the high dollar cars at auction. Put Breguet on their wrists and watch perspectives change. Also, you need to be at places like the Rensport Reunion, the Monaco Grand Prix, the Goodwood Festival of Speed. Again, be on the ground where you can show high dollar luxury buyers what Breguet has to offer. This is the relevant market. This is where a Breguet product can make huge inroads if you're there. Remember, luck is one part preparation and one part opportunity. Ace the preparation. Study for the test. And finally, be there at things like America's Cup title events, even if you're not a sponsor. Be there at the Louis Vuitton Cup, even if you're not a sponsor. And I'm not saying that you need to be there at OzFest or the Red Bull Flugtag, but you should be out there at non-traditional events, Breguet. Get the watches on people's wrist and into people's purview. Open their perspectives and do it in person. Shake hands. Finally, consider leaving Basel World Breguet because you will always be in the shadow, not just of Patek Philippe and Rolex, but of Omega. Within the Swatch Group, it's all about Omega. And you've got to compete with Harry Winston and Blancpain and Jacques Hedreau in the ultra-luxury group within Swatch. So do what Bremont is doing. Do what Breitling did this year. Move outside of the Basel World trade show. Have a month that is the month of Breguet. Let it be your month. Dominate the headlines that month. Fly in all the journalists. Bring in those guys who are scoring the cars and entering the cars and restoring the cars and racing the cars at Amelia Island and Pebble Beach and Monterey and Goodwood. And then make that month the month of Breguet. Do it in the fall during auction season. Make November your month every year and dominate the holiday season news cycle. Finally, consider this. Breguet by 2020 should be Patek Philippe Beauty, it should be Swatch Group Technology, and it should be FP Journe Panache. There is no reason by 2020 Breguet should not be there. I would also say close a few doors, end some distributorships. Move Breguet from the Swatch multi-brand Tourbillon boutiques. Only have Breguet in dedicated Breguet boutiques and flagship independent authorized dealers. And spend a few years building an aura of scarcity, occasion, and intrigue around Breguet. Epic product already exists, and you know you've got it. Breguet has some of the best watches in the industry, some of the watches that excite me the most right now. The 7027 La Tradition. What should a modern-day Breguet after the pocket watch era and the Type 20? pilot watches look like? It should look like this. This is iconic design and real innovation. In 2005, Breguet got it right out of the gate. This thing should be plastered everywhere at those relevant events. Striking and revitalizing for the brand. The 7727 Classic Chronometry, guaranteed to run minus one plus three seconds per day. Magnetic balance pivots, supporting the balance suspended in midair, 72,000 vibrations per hour, silicon escapement and hairspring. It won the GPHG Aguidor, the grand prize of watchmaking, the Oscars of watchmaking. This was best picture. With product like this and technology like this, you should not be playing 18th fiddle to FP Journ in haute de gamme and avant-garde horology. The 3880ST, you want the same escapement? The same 10 hertz escapement in a chronograph? How about a flyback function? How about a second time zone? How about a 100 meter water resistance and a silicon escapement? How about 20 beats per second? How about, yeah. Breguet sells this watch today. This is not a concept watch. You put Richard Mille on that dial, it's a 100 grand product. Breguet, about 20. This thing should be everywhere at sporting events that Breguet sponsors, and Breguet should sponsor more of them. Finally, the 5717 Horamundi. This is the best travel watch no one knows about. 
two separate time zones stored with a mechanical memory and a world time function. The dial featuring both lacquer and guilloche, featuring lapis lazuli and freehand engraving is decorated like the court of an 18th century French king. This is as beautiful as it gets, a watch that's technically advanced and beautifully handcrafted. Check out that day-night hand engraved gusting cloud and lapis lazuli with an engraved sun on top. Absolutely gorgeous with lacquered seas and guilloche cut dial on a solid gold dial blank. And finally, the 7800 La Musicale with an industry leading magnetic governor, not inertial, not friction. This is like a music box for your wrist, entirely handcrafted from the engraved flanks of the case to the platinum center dial cut on a rose lathe. This is as good as it gets, and I'm keeping an open mind about the new Marine series. I actually love the new Marine series 55. 47. You can get this in white gold. I'm showing you the titanium. It's an alarm and a dual time, and I love it to pieces. This is the kind of thing that Breguet is doing and taking risks while doing it, but there should be more risks like this. Made of titanium with an anthracite sunburst style. I'm keeping an open mind until I see these watches in person. To be sure, more exists, but this is a start. Finally, wrist shots. I asked and you answered. Dan V. owns a star of Basel World 2016, the Rolesium Dark Ruthenium Yacht Master that I showed you earlier. Beautiful dark Ruthenium sunburst dial with cyan blue accents. Amintas from the Middle East, a longtime connoisseur and friend of the house here at Watch You Want Later Watchbox, with my all-time favorite Patek Philippe, the Regulator 5235G. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Hey, guys, remember... Follow me, Tim underscore Masso, on Instagram for the most colorful shots on Instagram today. The biggest, three-dimensional, and most vivid watches you will find. I love video. Tim underscore Masso on Instagram when the broadcast ends. Guys, thank you for staying with me. Thank you so much. Comment if you're watching and you haven't subscribed. Please subscribe. I'm Tim. This is the Watchbox. Time out. Tim out. Thanks for logging on.